Hi, everyone. I'm C. Tiffany Lee, co-chair of Black Print, and welcome to Black Print's Black History Month film series in promotion of Entertainment Weekly's special edition, A Celebration of Black Film, a century of Black excellence at the movies on newsstands now and available on Amazon. Look at all those beautiful Black faces. In case you didn't know, Black Print represents the Black voice here at Meredith which brands that include people, in style, parents, and travel and leisure, and more, to help celebrate the notable contributions of Black people in the world of media and entertainment for our culture. We are so delighted today to have with us award-winning actress and producer, Ms. Nia Long, to chat about her career, the importance of Black representation in media, and Love Jones. And moderating our chat today is our very own People's Senior Publicist and Black Print Chair, Call it and gone. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Nia, for being a part of this conversation. We're so glad that you made time for this. And I just want to start by saying it's been 25 years since the beginning of production for Love Jones. I am not trying to meet another man at this time. You and I should uh, get together sometime and have a drink. I don't think that'll be a very good idea. Hey. Hmm. Persistence. Be surprised how far I can get you. Boom. I want to know, just to start off, what was it like being in, in that time? I know it was the beginning of your career. Tell us a little bit about where you were at that time in your life. Oh, my goodness. Um, I was just happy to be invited to the party, to be honest with you. I was young. I was raw, uh, excited for the opportunity because I felt like we hadn't seen anything on film that showed a different part of black culture. And coming off of, you know, the generation of hood flicks, which are also very powerful and, and important, I felt that Love Jones showed a different side of people, especially in Chicago and the spoken word and how powerful it was in speaking you know, our stories in a different way. It wasn't rap music, but it was, it's just like it goes back to the talking drum in Africa. Then you have the spoken word and you have the lyricist and the rapper. So it was a different part of our culture that was really beautiful. I didn't really know that much about the sp about spoken word at the time. Mm -hmm. um, my father was a poet. So poetry has always been super important to my life. I love that. Did you know that it would be the classic that it's become today when you were filming? Did you did you feel that while you guys were filming the movie? Well, I knew we were doing something and making something special. That goes without saying because there's a chemistry that Lorenz Tate and I have that is just undeniable. And he was so much fun to work with and we just trusted one another. And we really, you know, that bond is something super special. We had a perfect date, and I just wanted to feel like I was saving something for later. No, but baby, you ain't got to say nothing for me. I mean, you know, I, I want mine now. I don't think there's anyone that I've worked with where I still have that connection with and, and just acknowledging that in that moment, we did something different. And we haven't worked together since, which is... Why not? <laughs> I think we're both, honestly, I think there have been opportunities, but I think we are both so protective of Love Jones and what we created together that when you see Darius Love Hall and Nina Mosley, it's hard to separate Nia Long from Lorenz Tate. It's just like we are those, we embody those characters. So I'm sure it'll happen one day. <laughs> But I think most people are like, we want the sequel to Love Jones. And so I don't- He's asking when, when is the sequel coming? I know, I think in 2019, Lorenz teased on Instagram like, oh, is there something coming? And I was on the edge of my seat. So I'm still waiting for it too. But I, I wanna know from you, I just, I have this discussion with my girlfriends. I feel like the authenticity and the realness that came with Love Jones was really one of a kind. Like I'm waiting for a love story in 2021. That's just a love story that happens to feature black people. And I yeah. think that's what I'm, I'm craving and what I'm looking for. What do you think it was about that film that resonates so much? Like, 
that feeling? You know, it was the script. The script was great. It was honest, it was real, it was smart, it was layered with music and everything black and amazing. And Lorenz is from Chicago and I'm a Brooklyn girl. So there was just that authentic edge of two black people who have experienced urban life translating their experience in love. And I don't think you can, I mean, there have been some beautiful black love stories since then, but what made Love Jones unique is that it was the first. And I think the first of our generation, because in my mind, mahogany is the first or one of the first, yeah. but it made us feel something that we hadn't had an opportunity to feel. So I, you know, I think that that's the movie magic when you have the right location, the right setting, the right actors, and you have the right material, you know, things usually turn out well. Yeah. Speaking mm -hmm. of the right setting, I want to touch on Boys in the Hood and working with John Singleton. Um, you had the opportunity to work with, you know, a Black director, a Black cast so often when you were younger. How do you feel like that shaped your career? Because I feel like now people are really dying to get back to that, to get back to, you know, working with people who really understand our stories and really understand our struggles and our love and the things that make Black people so unique. Um, how do you feel like you benefited from having that when you were younger and allowing that to grow with you in your career? Well, I'm still young <laughs> and I'm still yes, young. Of course you are. <laughs> but you know, it's a long, it's a long career. And so I don't ever put, I don't associate my age with my experiences. I associate my experiences with my development as a human and as an artist, right? And so I was lucky enough to start acting and really sort of having unique opportunities in a time where Black people, it was the 90s. The 90s was just a special era. It was the era that Black everything beautiful, proud, loud, and in your face it was undeniable. Mm -hmm. And I'm so lucky, I feel so blessed to have been a part of that because that was a culture defining moment for everyone. It really was. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, I love how unapologetic you are. You're so authentic to yourself. You're so authentic to black culture. Where do you feel like that spirit comes from? Because I know at Black Print, we talk a lot about, you know, the importance of diversity, the importance of representation, the importance of fighting for our stories. Um, and you're such a big advocate of that. Where do you find that spirit and that passion to keep pushing for, for our culture? I guess you gotta talk to my mama and my daddy. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I think, look, my mother was a big hippie. She still is. She's an artist. She's a singer. My family's from the West Indies. My grandparents, Grenada, Trini, uh, Barbados. And so we, I wasn't taught to be anything else but my authentic self. Mm -hmm. We don't put on airs in our family. People walk around naked. People are cooking in the kitchen and women are talking and talking. Shit. I don't know if I can say that, but that's how I grew up. We grew up just being who we are and we didn't have a lot of money. Everybody was educated. In fact, I'm the only person in my family that didn't go to college or finish college, but we were educated and proud and we traveled. That, that's the one thing I encourage all young people to do is save your money and travel because something happens to your soul and to your spirit when you go and you see how other people live. It lends for better understanding. It lends for better acceptance. And it, and it really, it's like a gift because the, the enrichment that you gain from traveling changes the way you approach every single situation because it's no longer about what you know, it's about what you've learned from someone else. And I think when we open our hearts to those experiences, that's what makes art good because we're not just representing black people born in America, we are representing the black experience. And that goes far beyond what we see in front of us. And what we've been exposed to growing up. Yeah, yeah some of us, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Love that. How have you seen, 
kind of the evolution of Hollywood in terms of acceptance um, throughout throughout the time that, you know, when you started until now? Mm. Well, I'll tell you something. When I started in the business, most of the films that I worked on were black films. The crew was black, the director was black, the writer was black, the, the not, not always the crew, let me correct myself, because there was always a lack of diversity. John Singleton was the one director who's like, this is a black thing and you looked around and everybody was black. So as I began, and because that was my first experience, I thought that was the norm, that the next set that I went to was going to be black, black, black. But what I realized it wasn't. Oftentimes there was a black director, black actors, and the entire crew would be white, which I don't really care if, you, if you're good at your do job. If you're good at your job, you should have the job. But what bothers me is the opportunities weren't always offered to black people. And so we were sort of pushed out behind the camera and that created an environment where you'd walk into the hair and makeup trailer and there was no one there to service you to understand your hair and makeup needs. And then you were labeled difficult if you said, no, I'm not getting in front of camera looking like this because I could do it better myself. And so I think that was a big struggle in the early 90s and still to this day. And it got me to a place where I had to actually walk with my own hair and makeup and I learned how to take care of myself on set because imagine going to work to act. That is a tool, that's your heart, your gut, everything goes into a performance and you're worried about how you look. It's just unfair and it makes no sense and it's counterproductive to the, the process. And so now I think the new generation of, of leaders in this business and the new generation of of actresses and writers and producers and directors, they're demanding diversity in a way that my generation really couldn't. Um, we would ask, but it wasn't always granted. And so now there is an awareness and there's a, I'm not taking no for an answer attitude, which is really amazing. And I'm, I'm really proud of the, the next group of leaders in this industry that are putting their foot down and saying no, we deserve to have the same experience as the next white actress. Also, when you go on a white set, so like for instance, when I did the movie Alfie with Jude Law, I walked on that set and I could not believe the difference mm -hmm. from craft service, which is where you get your snacks, to the lunch line, to the way I was treated. It was like heaven. There were no problems. It just was a different experience. I can't even, the energy was different. There was no stress. It was like, we're making a movie. We all have money, whatever you want, Nia. And I had no problems, but you know, so that's across the board. That's not just Hollywood. That shows up in every experience that I've ever had as a black woman whether it's a restaurant or a nail salon, or when I walk into, a, just the other day, I'm here in New York City and I walked into a place to grab something to eat with my son and it was my godson's uh, birthday and we had balloons and the maitre d' said, I'm so sorry, you can't bring the balloons in the restaurant. And I said, why? That doesn't make any sense. The child is four. And he basically said, well, you can leave if you don't like it. And I know in my heart that if I was not black, it would have been a very different moment. And it's not that I'm oversensitive. It's not that I'm anti anything. I'm pro love and whatever that means is what I stand for. But I know that as a black woman, I've had a very different experience. And I, I don't even think black men all the time have the same experience as black women. Exactly. They have a different experience that is as equally difficult. But the blatant disrespect that I've experienced throughout my life, which sometimes comes off as if we have, you know, people can always say, well, black women have a chip on their shoulder. No, it's not a chip. It's not a chip on our shoulder. It's us protecting ourselves because we know what we've experienced and we know that we haven't been heard. 
So now is a beautiful time because we get to talk about it. We get to be about it. And we don't have to say we're sorry for anything because this is who we are and we can stand proud in it. And so I look forward to film and television capturing that spirit and depicting roles for us that are a true embodiment of who we are. I that was a long you. answer. I love <laughs> the energy that you're bringing because you are so right. And I think that comes too with, you know, being an actress, but also stepping into producing, which you did recently. And I wanna know, from you, with that experience and all of the strength that you feel like you have now, what would you tell Nia just starting out? If you could tell her anything about the journey that's about to ensue. Oh my goodness. I think I would tell her not to take it personal. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I think, you know, all my life, I've always heard, oh, you're so pretty, you're so beautiful, you're so this, you're so that. And I never cared about that. I'd rather be smart and good at what I do than to be complimented on my vanity. I mean, I thank God for giving me the face that I have and my health and all of those things. But for me, it was almost harder being who I am on the inside and having a face that was expected to just sit there and be quiet and listen and be pretty. Mm -hmm. And I have opinions. I'm not afraid to speak up. Um, and I think when I was younger, you have to understand I'm a Brooklyn born girl. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. So I know I had to learn how to code switch very quickly and early on in my life because certain things just weren't acceptable in certain environments. And that's not a bad thing. I think we, we, we all need to know what's appropriate for where you are and who you're around. But I also think that when it starts to feel like where you are is completely, unex, unex, is, is completely void of, ex, of accepting you for who you are, then that's where it's problematic. So I would say don't take things personally because you don't know what the next person was taught or what the next person is experiencing. That's really, that's a good one. That's a yeah. Good one. And I feel like we're still, I'm still learning that every day, just working in the industry as well. Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, I feel for, for young women working on the, on the corporate side of things because Oftentimes as artists, we can get away with saying and doing things in the name of art right. more so than what you can probably do or the next black woman can do who's working in a corporate atmosphere. But I think corporations are getting smart and wise about how they have to change their mandates and how they have to be accommodating and how they can't just talk about it, but they need to be about diversity and supporting the black community and, and, and creating opportunities for black women and men who are qualified. Yes, times are definitely changing. I think that brands and companies are getting wise to the fact that they need us for everyone listening. Oh, they've known, don't get it twisted. They've known they need us. They know that they now have to acknowledge that they need us. That's the difference. Love that, I love that. Um, so we just lost the great pioneer, Cicely Tyson. Um, really quickly, I just wanna um, hear from you about what you feel like her legacy meant to you, the path that you feel like she has like allowed other Black women in Hollywood to continue to follow in, and just your thoughts on you know her passing and her impact on the culture. Well, first of all, I feel very blessed and lucky to have actually met her and hugged her because I feel like I got some of her juju and I'm holding on to it for dear I love life. Her juju. I need that. I need that juju. Look, this is a woman who had seven decades of a beautiful career who has won almost every single award there is to win. She's an icon. She's a trailblazer. She's a triple threat. She was married to my jazz hero, Miles Davis. I wish I could be a fly on the wall in their bedroom. Not for anything weird or anything, but I would just love to know what they talked about when they, they were like at home having pillow talk. Um, Cicely Tyson was the first time that I had ever seen 
a brown skin chocolate sister on film. And there were other women during her era that were equally as famous and recognized, but I know that her journey was a little bit more difficult because of her complexion and the fact that she was chocolate. I think darker skinned women have or have had a more challenging experience in the world. I hate to say it, but it's true. Mm -hmm. um, I remember growing up in, in Los Angeles, I wasn't light enough to hang with like the mixed light skinned girls, but I also wasn't dark enough to hang with the chocolate girls. And that's the colorism that we need to examine within our communities. So I look at her and I say, thank God that we had a woman like her to remind us to keep pushing forward when things get difficult and seem impossible. I love that. I have a couple more questions and then we're gonna go to the audience Q&A. But I wanna ask, um, you have two beautiful boys. Mm -hmm. um, this climate now, how do you feel like as a black parent, having those conversations that so many black parents have to have with their kids, how do you juggle that, but still raise them to be very proud to be black, um, very unapologetic about who they are, but then also educate them about, you know, the issues that are happening in society right now? Well, first, let me say this. During COVID, what I've been able to do is pull back the curtain on private school education. Mm -hmm. Private school education in many cases is a sham because they are not catering to the way that our children learn. They are not doing anything exceptional and our children quite frankly are behind. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge concern of mine because I went to public school and I got a decent education. I was a great student and there's nothing wrong with public school, but as you make more money and become more successful, the system tells you that you need to put your kids in private school. Well, I can say that the private school system has totally let me down because now I'm involved daily in seeing what these children are learning. And whether your child is in public or private school, I'm concerned about the fallout that's going to happen that is going to affect black and brown children directly. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do with this generation of children, this generation of black boys, this generation of black girls who have not received the proper education and whose parents don't have the means to hire tutors because they're trying to work and Zoom school at the same time. This country has got to step up in that area. I'm hoping that our new president and his administration puts a light on that because it is going to perpetuate a serious chain of events that will be very problematic. For me, I've tried to teach my boys to always be black and proud and to never let anybody tell them otherwise. And I've actually sort of, I have a hybrid going with my little one where I am including things within his curriculum that are directly related to him being a black boy living in America. Yeah, because I feel like as, so much has come to light in the last year, but you just really realize that the, the American education system is a little bit biased and you're not learning everything that you could be learning as a black American, but I totally, I totally understand. Yeah, it's, it's not designed for us, not at all. I mean, the fact that we only have one month on the calendar for black history month tells you everything right there. And if I'm like, there's so many other heroes. Uh, why is it that we only learn about Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King there's so many other people that, that our kids need to be aware of. And so I'm taking this opportunity to drop in and, you know, guide the teachers and learn with my son, because quite honestly, there are certain things that I missed about our history because they didn't teach us that. Exactly. So it's been a good time and a bad time because you feel like, whoa, now I understand why our boys are not always prepared, but there's a whole new school of black men and black women leadership that are very conscious and extremely fearless. 
and extremely radical, but in a good way. And not a, yeah, not afraid to say what they think. So that that's like the next generation of of, of freedom fighters, in my opinion. And I'm, you know, I'm I'm raising my boys to be conscious, and that's I think the important thing. I love that. I love that. So tell us, lastly, before I go to the Q and A, what is next? For you, what are you up to? What can we expect? Oh, um, well, I'm excited. I just got nominated for an NAACP I award, saw yesterday. which is awesome. I'm happy about that. The banker was a special project. It really sort of the story is basically about the importance of generational wealth and how do we build up our communities and how these two men that were entrepreneurs essentially changed history and how um, my character and how the woman is always sort of the backbone of, of that experience. Um, so I'm excited about that. It's good. And what I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm recording a book. I don't think I can talk about the title just yet, but it is, it is definitely a classic. And this is a follow-up to a classic and I'm excited. Um, I'm a huge fan of the author and it's been challenging for me because my sound booth is literally in my bathroom. <laughs> and so every night I go in with a glass of wine and I turn all the lights off and I try to immerse myself into this world. So that's been so that. much fun. I love to listen to an audio book recorded by you. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it's, it's just, this is definitely my first audio book experience. And it's, I respect, you know, these voice artists that I don't know so much because it's, it's not easy because you're switching between voices and, you know, with acting, you're focused on one character with a, with a voice book, you're actually, or an audio book, you're actually doing, you know, five or six voices at a time. So I'm doing that. Um, I have a couple of things that I'm working on in development. I have two, two or three projects in development. And then um, there's a couple of other things that you yeah. might you might hear about soon that I think everybody will be really happy about, but I'm not allowed to talk about them. Well, I'm just going to say, if it's Best Man Holiday, <laughs> I think you all know, because that's what I'm begging for. You didn't hear anything from me. <laughs> I'm crossing my fingers for it, but we'll, we'll be surprised when it comes out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Before I let you go, I'm going to ask a couple of audience questions. Um, people are dying to know if there's going to be a sequel to Love Jones, but I know you touched on that. Um, they want to know what your lasting memory was that you have of filming with Lorenz on set. Oh my gosh. As for a sequel, I have no idea. There have been rumors for years. Um, if I got paid for every rumor, I'd be so rich right now because I have no idea what's going to happen with that. My memory, my most favorite memory of Love Jones was the kiss in the rain. We were on such a tight budget. We had no time and it was literally pouring down rain and we didn't have like the proper gear. And I knew I was going to be in the rain for a long time. So I wrapped myself in plastic garbage bags and taped my entire body up and then put the coat on. And it just goes to show you that, you know, you got to get it done no matter how. There's always, if there's a will, there's a way. And I just whenever I think of the film, I just think of how beautiful it was to see two black people kissing in the rain. Like, ah, oh, it just, that image to me, not, it could have been any other actress. I don't even care if it was me or not, but that image was so beautiful. It's such a beautiful image. I remember, yeah. I mean, I watched that movie probably once every two months, I kid you not. And I'm always talking to my roommate about the fact that I would not be out in the rain. <laughs> But if I was, it would be for love. And I feel like that was so iconic about that scene was that, you know, you didn't care. Like you're just out there and you're feeling it and you're, you know, in that moment. And it really brings the audience into that moment with you. It's such a beautiful, beautiful scene. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Um, second question, when you look back, what stands out the most about filming movies in the 90s? Oh, um, what stands out the most? 
it all stands out to be honest because I was just so excited that it was actually happening. I was like, oh my gosh, it's happening. And we didn't have social media. We didn't have, I mean, we had like the star and the inquirer, but we didn't have quick connections to the audience. So I didn't know if I was making an impact or not, which was probably a good thing because I just had tunnel vision and I kept moving forward. I think the opportunity and the realization that my dreams were actually manifesting was the thing that stands out because I'm not, there was no roadmap for me. There wasn't like an older generation of people that showed me this is how you do it. It was very much learning on the job and I've made mistakes. I'm not perfect. We all make mistakes, you know, going through the process. I think watching Whoopi on set and how she is just, nobody can with Whoopi. I don't know if I can say I've said it twice, but whatever. Whoopi is, she taught me set etiquette. She taught me how to ask for what you want and the thing that I really realized about her and what I learned about her the most is you can ask for whatever you want and need, but you have to deliver. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between a diva who thinks like, oh, I'm a movie star, I should have all of these things versus the artist who says, I need production to support me in this way and they deliver stellar performances time after time again. And so there was a level of stepping up my game as an actress that I learned by, by working with her. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, last question, everyone is obsessed with the Love, the Love Jones soundtrack. What is your favorite song? From oh my gosh. The other day I was cleaning which I find myself doing a lot these days yeah. because the less traffic in your house, the better. And I was listening to the soundtrack and I, and I love a sentimental mood. Like the beginning of that song takes me back to the moment as if it was yesterday. I just, that, do, 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 do. Yeah. Oh, I love it. That whole soundtrack though was really one of a kind because we had, everybody on that soundtrack and we all on that soundtrack and we also had so many different genres on that soundtrack it definitely it was it was so good the whole movie is good everyone's about to watch it right after this um we're we, we're so grateful that you joined us today um thank you so much for dedicating your time to us of course on the call for attending definitely go out and watch the banker support nia and all of her upcoming projects she has exciting things that are coming up um follow black print meredith on instagram for you know all the latest on what we're doing and we hope you guys enjoy love jones it's starting in about two minutes yay thank you, <laughs> bye. Thank you so much paula bye Thank <music> you.